The year is 539 BC and Daniel chapter 5 describes one day in that year. It begins with a king throwing a big party. It ends with his execution. The empire of Babylon is waning and now it's going to be the turn of the Medes and the Persians. It's the sort of thing that the history books are, are full of. The person at the centre of this chapter is Belshazzar. I'm going to give you just a little bit of background here. It's a bit of a boring, it's a bit boring, but it's, it's important. He's referred to here as the son of Nebuchadnezzar. But it's actually 28 years since that man has died. And four kings have ruled since then. And now Belshazzar's father, Nabonidus, is in fact uh, the main king in Babylon. But the Persian army are at the gates. Nabonidus has departed and left his son Belshazzar in charge of the situation. That's probably why when Belshazzar offers Daniel a place, he offers him third place because his dad's still around. Now Daniel chapter 5 could have been a very short chapter. Could have gone something like this. There was a young royal left by his dad to guard a city from invaders, but he was too fond of the good life. And instead of leading the army, he was thrown a party. Short chapter. But what makes it a long chapter is the explanation of why these things happened. When you know that the enemy are at the gates, the behaviour of the first four verses looks a lot like escapism. The drinking, the contempt for sacred things, the pagan praise. This is eat, drink and be merry on steroids. But here's what the explanation will reveal. The tragedy of these events is not the failure to protect the city from the Persians, but rather the failure to reckon with the real threat. It's not the kingdom of the Medes and Persians that Belshazzar needs to worry about, but rather the kingdom of God. And that's what moves this from being ancient history that's pretty irrelevant in some ways, to being a really important issue for our lives today. The world, like Belshazzar and his lords, is full of people who are preoccupied with those who are, as it were, at the city gates. Perhaps there's been no time in our history when there's been more anxiety about what might be coming. Tragically, though, we can be defiantly blind to the one who is far greater and who wields eternal influence over our lives. In Daniel chapter 5, you'll notice that the Persian army hardly gets a look in. Instead, we're left staring at the fingers of a human hand, writing four words on the plaster of the wall. God is visibly present. Now, we're going to just take a little step back so we might be clear about who this God really is. So here's the first thing we're going to think about today. Meet the God who is a mighty saviour. <clears throat> 2002, President Bush, in his State of the Union address, spoke of Iran, Iraq and North Korea as a so-called axis of evil. He sought to encourage the Americans to view these nations in a particular way and join in his war on terror. But how does God view those nations? Now, Babylon is a ruthless nation. Its charge sheet would be full of genocide and war crimes. It would be easy to cheer when you get to the end of chapter 5 at the overthrow of this evil empire. But God hasn't given us the book of Daniel simply to tell us the evil won't win. Prophet Jeremiah was a contemporary of Daniel. Daniel was in Babylon. Jeremiah was in Jerusalem. He operated in Judah during this period of war and upheaval and deportation. And he spoke God's word into this context. And this is Jeremiah chapter 24. He has a vision after Nebuchadnezzar has come to Jerusalem in 605 BC and transported off some of the land's best people officials, skilled workers, craftsmen. The vision he has is of two baskets of figs, one good, the other rotten. 
This is the explanation. These good figs, like these good figs, I regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians. My eyes will watch over them for their good. Daniel and his three friends and lots of other people besides in that deportation are God's choice people inserted into Babylon to do this place much good. Now, Jeremiah, a little bit later in chapter 29, writes a letter to those exiles. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you, says the Lord. Pray to the Lord for it. For if it prospers, you too will prosper. <clears throat> the book of Daniel is about two kingdoms. The earthly kingdom of Babylon and the kingdom of God. God takes some of his faithful people from Judah, plucks them out of their homes and their families, takes them from their friends, takes them away from their jobs and places them in Babylon so that the people of this nation will will know there is a greater king and a better kingdom. God has chosen to reveal the existence of his kingdom, its authority and even its welcome to pagan nations as an expression of his love. And he does so through the lives of his people. Question. Does living in Grace Mount feel like exile? Does the weather, the restrictions, the alien culture, the scenery make you yearn from perhaps where you came from or for somewhere else? For the same reason God called his people out of one place and into another place, so God has called people together to be his church in Grace Mount. Let me just uh, read you those words from Jeremiah 24 again. But don't think of Babylon, think, think Grace Mount. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Like these good figs, I regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians. My eyes will watch over them for their good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. And the task is the same. It's to live among the kingdoms of this world, as those who belong to the kingdom of God. That's what you see Daniel and his friends doing. So in chapter one, they live by different standards. Do you remember the phrase, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. The law of God, the commandments of his king, instructed these boys how to live lives that were not compromised by the pagan culture that they were among. And, and here's how it looked for us. We'll, we'll resolve to keep Sunday special when everyone else treats it like any other day of the week. We'll resolve to respect authority, beginning with our parents in a culture that hates authority. We'll resolve to pursue purity and sex in a sex-mad culture. We'll resolve to be generous givers when everyone else is consumed with grabbing as much as they can. And there are people who answer to a different king. So remember, Daniel's three friends, how they respond to the king's fury. The God we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the images that you've set up. Now, in some ways, Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego are a little preview of the king who will reply to Pilate. You would have no power over me if it were not given you from above. As Jesus stands before the Roman judge and the baying mob, he knows that his life is securely held in the hands of his father. But as he humbles himself and goes down into death, God his father will in due course highly exalt him. So here's why we can be different. In the Jeremiah passage about the good figs, God says, my eyes will watch over them for their good. Now, Daniel wouldn't have been human if he hadn't felt nervous about the regime at the gates. Um, if you read the second half of Daniel, you find that some of the dreams and visions he has before chapter 5. He gets a little preview of what the, the Persians are going to be like. 
the picture that he has of Babylon is of a lion with its wings, with the wings of an eagle. But it's about to be replaced by a bear gorging on the ribs of a carcass. And Daniel would encounter the savage side of the Persians. But God would be watching. And he would rescue him because he's a saviour. And this is all for Babylon's benefit. It's all to reveal that single most important thing you need to know about the king of this kingdom. That he is a saviour. He saves people from furnaces. He saves people from lions. He saves people from death. All those called together by God to convey his love to this community of Grace Mount. We will live ordinary and we will live in the ordinary everyday things of our lives by these different standards. And, and even in the crisis of our lives, we we'll want to demonstrate that we really believe that we serve a king who is our saviour. Let me bring you to the other side of this. Because the other side of the story is one of judgment. But the God behind the judgment is never forget a reluctant judge. So back to Belshazzar's party. It's a scene of noise and laughter and fooling around all until this hand appears. These are people who are trying to escape reality, but reality comes looking for them. This hand writes four words graffiti-like on the plaster. And these four words demolish the king's self-confidence. They leave him hardly able to speak or stand. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Reality has gate crashed the king's attempt to distract himself. His kingdom has been shaken by the Persian army out there and by a mysterious hand in the palace. And he's desperate to find out what it means. So he calls urgently for his enchanters and astrologers. But as usually is the case, they're no help. And he's even more terrified. I think it's a bit like this. Imagine your doctor sent you an email with the word urgent in the subject box. But you can't open the file. That's where Belshazzar thinks he is. So let Belshazzar speak to those of us who are not Christians. There will be a time when understanding God's word will be of the greatest importance. But almost certainly what happens then will be linked to what has happened on an earlier occasion, an earlier occasion, when we've been made aware of that same word. When Daniel arrives in the scene, he doesn't begin by explaining the words on the wall. No, verse 18 goes back to the events of chapter 4, which probably happened 30 years previously. Now, all through this period, as Babylon's power begins to wane, you're getting little hints of this other kingdom. Chapter 2, the king can't sleep. Maybe night after night, he can't sleep. He's having the same dream. Then in chapter 3, he makes his presence felt in the angry encounter between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel's three friends. But chapter 4 is the big one. This loud, ruthless, arrogant monarch. He's been so taken with his Babylon and his power and glory and majesty. is reduced to the level of a cow in a field. But the really massive surprise is to discover that this arrogant monarch, when he emerges from this experience, humbly sings of a greater kingdom and a better king. Do you remember those words that started off chapter 4? It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs! How mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. And then Daniel turns to Belshazzar and he puts the sword in. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, although you knew all this. You set yourself up against the Lord of heaven by your use of the temple vessels and your pagan worship. 
As surely as Belshazzar became convinced that God was behind the experience of Nebuchadnezzar, so people in Jesus' day who saw the miracles realised that these things were glimpses of the kingdom of God. Jesus' miracles were evidence that he could deliver a future free from disease and evil and shortage and separation. But listen to what he said. Then Jesus began to denounce the times in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Do you, do you see the mistake? It's to go on operating by the rules of this kingdom when you really know there is a more important king and a greater kingdom. But Shazer's attention was focused on today, on the present. He was thinking about how to have a good time, how to feel good about himself. We live in this community called Grace Mount, but it could be anywhere. And they all have their systems and their unspoken rules. Life is preoccupied with now, today, what we're going to eat, what we're going to watch. It's shaped by what other people do. Is living together okay? Is cash in hand okay? Well, we like to think we know how to navigate the system safely. But if that's you... And you know there's another king and a different kingdom, but you live by the rules of this kingdom. Then here's three words that you need to think about. First word, time. It's this word, many. It means God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Time. If the last ten months has taught us anything, it's taught us that life is uncertain. Those things that we most took for granted have been removed. Opportunities have vanished. We've discovered that the I'll do it later motto is a very dangerous one. What was the king planning to do tomorrow? Oh, he only had today. Listen to Jesus again. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come. Life does contain some significant moments. Moments which what we do then will affect what happens to us later. The gospel is not just information. It comes with implications. It demands repentance. It calls on me to bend my will to the will of this king. Time. Here's the second word, exam, tackle. You've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. There is an exam coming. The secret of exams is to know the question. So what is going to be weighed? Here's some words I read yesterday in the book of Proverbs. A person weighs seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Perhaps Belshazzar thought he was a good guy. Maybe you think you're a decent individual. But it really doesn't matter what we think. The exam won't be asking us how much money we've given to charity or how often we've been to visit our elderly relative. It will be asking us why we do those things. It will scrutinise my motives. And in that examination, it will reveal just how impure and mixed my motives really are. But picture a different king. A naked man hangs from a Roman cross. But more than his body is on view here. It's as if the curtain has been pulled back. And we get to see this king's motives. This is the... Shepherd King, who doesn't save his own skin when the wolf appears, but instead dies for his sheep. This is the one who is crushed and ground like wheat in a mill to feed his people. This is the King who has come to lead his people through judgment. Let me say to those of you who are marking your own paper and giving yourself a pass, think again. This is the king you should want to rule over you. 
This is the king. I need to pl deliberately place myself under his rule. This is the, the only king who can really subdue my pride and give me better motives to live for. Time, exam, final word, departure. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Belshazzar wasn't thinking this would be his last day. And Belshazzar certainly wasn't ready to depart. Now you can read Daniel as though his life was wall-to-wall -wall excitement. But there's 30 years or more between chapters 4 and 5. Now he's at least 80 years old. For the last 30 years he's been a nobody, maybe a doorman in the Parks and Gardens Department. But if you ask what he's been doing, the answer is he's been humbly waiting for God's kingdom to come. He's been expressing his dependence on his king, regularly praying three times a day from what we see later in the book. He's been going to the Bible for direction. And at work in a pagan environment where there's kickbacks and sickies and people lie about their expenses. He's been faithfully and sincerely serving his king. You see, if today was Daniel's last day, he was raised to depart. God didn't write these words on the wall for Belshazzar. He wrote these words on the wall for us. It is possible to be ready to depart. The God who is saviour has provided us with a great king <clears throat> who knows how to lead his people through judgment and bring them safely into a glorious kingdom.